So what do I mean by this cryptic title, Mailman on Privacy, what's really new? Um, probably should get to that first. So um, uh, let me, uh, please indulge me with a little bit of editorial uh, publicity here. So this is basically uh, part of my work on writing the first introduction to algorithmic ethics in the French language. And um, I think someone has unmuted their um, their microphone, so I'm hearing loud typing typing in on my on my hand. <laughs> um, so just a, a slight remark. And so this is actually this is going to be a two volume introduction. The first volume is unfairness and privacy in automated decision making. Um, and one of the sub part of that first volume is a chapter on privacy of course, and uh, especially, and one of the goals of this chapter is to understand the specific effects of machine learning techniques on the new challenges of privacy in the digital life. Uh, also been influenced by my work at the University of Lorraine at Nancy with a charter on privacy by design in uh, ML models, especially against model inversion attacks and um, uh, membership inference attacks for those who are familiar with those problems. And I'm not going to do the entire chapter. I tried to do it um, a couple of days ago. It just lighted, uh, it just that it lasted 19 minutes instead of 45. So I thought I would have to scale down a little bit and uh, focus on one issue, which is um, the issue of invasive inferential power from seemingly innocuous source. And um, so let me try to be quick on the general methodology of the book and the chapter. Uh, I, I'm going to talk fast over this because I, uh, I know I have a lot to go over to. Um, and uh, I, uh, don't worry, I will slow down on the, the most important thing when we get to the um, substance of the issue. So um, basically, one of the first challenges to identify the specific role of machine learning and privacy related problems so uh, the problem that we have to, when you, in order to do such an identification is that modern machine learning, uh, and by that I mean the machine learning that has emerged in the last decades in the new summer of AI, is partly concomitant with the rise of big data and the transfer of large sectors of social life, uh, social life in the, most, uh, in the widest possible sense, not just uh, social networks, um, to the digital realm. And so there are two dependent phenomena. Machine learning and big data are two dependent phenomena, especially because organizations collect throngs of data because they can analyze them. And the alleged power of machine learning is thus a driver of large scale collection. Um, but they're nevertheless, nevertheless separated because a lot of privacy problematic phenomena have nothing to do with machine learning per se. Uh, so it's not that easy to, uh, to isolate that machine learning component in uh, privacy, uh, digital privacy issues, so to say. And the second challenge is, of course, to uh, start to balance uh, the episteme part and the politique part of my work. Um, so I'm a philosopher of science uh, by training and experience. Um, but of course, uh, those kind of issues mean that you have to hold together uh, philosophy of science and political philosophy so on the one hand, as a philosopher of science, you have to understand the specific epistemic input of machine learning. So you're typically going to start thinking of that as a particular phenomena in the long debates over models and theories and algorithm and computer simulations. So that's going to be your first uh, impulse as a philosopher of science. But then you have to remember this is a political problem and, and you have to sort of frame all of that in the long tradition, very, very long and very rich tradition of reflection on privacy and the short tradition on personal data. And the, and the problem with that is that, well, you cannot completely idolate, of course, as a political part and the, uh, the epistemic part of those problems. So this is very much a big ball of wax of a problem. And also the problem is that the notion of privacy is extremely elastic, it has various scopes, and is entangled with so many other issues like freedom of expression, scientific research, civil liberties, and so on and so forth. That's on unto itself, it's a mess. Uh, so that's another um, structural problem uh, in the book. Uh, 
And so how do I try to deal with um, those structural issues of the book? Um, so I try to use, since I'm an historical epistemologist, I try to use uh, often comparative approach uh, and try to look for uh, long-term trends in history. So I, I have two, um, two components to my comparative approach, so to say. Uh, the, the first is what I call the much too long run um, perspective. Um, because historians tend to cringe me when they see me do that because uh, well, I, I, it looks like I, I'm going to cover 5,000 years of history of computation and data, which would be a little bit uh, over the top. But I'm not trying to do that exactly. What I'm trying to do is I try to use anthropology of cognitive techniques, um, uh, famously uh, founded by the British anthropologist Jack Goody, and also the archaeological debate in the origins of writing as a source of inspiration to start and frame uh, the issues that we have um, between political life and, uh, cognit and that new cognitive techniques that is computer science. So um, that's a first source of inspiration. Um, and I, I try to, to uh, make clearer a little bit later why it's a source of inspiration because I, I guess it's not obvious for everybody right now. And in the shorter run, uh, I try to um, <coughs> compare uh, all of this, I compare machine learning algorithm, especially the, the most famous or infamous uh, opaque algorithms such as deep learning with other types of algorithms that are similarly innocuous because they are deemed more simple or more interpretable or more classical, whatever that may mean. Um, so basically very simple things like decision trees, classical statistical modeling, to try and get a, what I call an algorithmic contrast class. So uh, contrast the effect of machine learning with other algorithm to try and have a clearer view and more specific view of what machine learning is. And we'll see that we I have a very specific contrast class for privacy problem, which is information cross-checking. Um, so, that's the first uh, thing. And the second thing, uh, even harder from a methodological point of view is to, um, so to say, stay on the algorithm, which is harder than it looks um, because it's an introduction to algorithmic ethics, not to everything digital under the sun. Um, because when you start to talk about um, ethical and political and legal problems around algorithm, you get entangled with history of the internet, history of, of uh, the me public media, history of communication network, um, a whole bunch of political philosophies, issues, uh, freedom of expression, censorship, uh, and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, you start to talk about everything that gets a computer involved, and that's not how you're going to finish the darn thing anytime soon if you start talking about all of that. So you have to try and focus and that object, the algorithm, and try to strike a tight balance between, um, well, focusing on phenomena where algorithmization of decision-making has a substantial ethical impact. Um, not everything that has an algorithm behind it is worthy of being fi uh, part of algorithmic ethics. That's what I'm trying to say. And at the same time, if I go through case studies, um, I try to, you have to remember, and you are forced to remember that algorithms live in a broader social technical system, uh, which include the legal and political institution behind them more often than not, and also the habits and training on the user and so on and so forth. So any, any easy strategy that you try to develop to start to narrow down your object, start running into the problems that you can basically not isolate it from other forces. And uh, so it's a constant issue. And uh, well, I guess I will be judged by the result where, where the thing come out, comes out. Um, um, so what I will and will not say in machine learning and privacy today, because as I said, I'm not covering the old chapter. There are a lot of issues um, involving machine learning techniques uh, that are worthy of being mentioned in a discussion of digital privacy. One of them is profiling, of course. Uh, the other is recognition technology, especially FRT, facial recognition technology, and live FRT, uh, which of course has been a topic of passionate debate in the last years. 
other, a little bit less famous, but extremely interesting is sentiment analysis and other forms of ML driven behavioral knowledge. Um, that's also a big thing. We will mention it briefly, but it will not be at the core of what I'm talking about today. And what I'm going to talk about today is um, to put it in a voluntarily um, abrupt and cryptic form is machine learning and the key power to identify. Um, so I will try to explain my title uh, right now as I start working. So um, basically presentation is divided um, in two parts, uh, very easy um, division. Uh, first is knowing what from what. Um, so it's basically um, a way to start delimiting the problem raised by uh, the disturbing power of ML-driven statistical inference. So um, uh, I will try to pinpoint what that means in that in that part. And then in the second part, I will try to to show you that those epistemic innovations of uh, machine learning and its use in recent in the recent decades actually called for very radical reflection on the foundation of our legal order uh, and, and the very concepts at the core of our data protection laws, uh, focusing on the European case and the, uh, the notion of um, data protections or they are articulated in European law. Um, not only because of uh, European uh, jinkoism on my part, but because they are often, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Law, is often taken as a gold standard uh, in um, terms of respect of privacy in international laws and, and is imitated partly because of that, of that image uh, throughout the world right now. Also, of course, partly for commercial reasons and being able to, uh, uh, to uh, trade with Europe. Um, but that just shows that the pe people have the idea that if you're able to pass the GDPR test, well, you're basically able to go everywhere because this is the most stringent test in terms of respect of data protection law. Um, so let me get to it by not talking about the issue first. So, which is that using my contrast class, my algorithmic contrast class, um, to just show you, I try to uh, disentangle machine learning and other um, aspect of the um, digital life that also comes to mind when you, when you talk about digital privacy. So um, first idea is big data knows it was you. Um, so my contrast class, my algorithmic contrast class here will be simple information cross-checking. One of the most basic a use of any database for decades is to cross-check information. And what recent innovations um, have shown, I think, uh, in the past decades uh, or so, and I voluntarily have here examples running over 15 years, um, is that the massification of data collection, the automation of informational information search, and uh, a more subtle and more refined, but not always even more refined use of information cross-checking leads to an extremely increased power of identification and re-identification. So basically you could see already in 2000, so many years before the um, current uh, summer of AI, you could already identify 87% of the American population by just cross-checking both the uh, those day dates, um, zip code and gender. So that's pretty intuitive, actually. There are not so many people who live in your same zip code, have the same gender as you, and has the same birth date as you. Um, it's pretty intuitive, but you can actually show that this intuition is right. It's those th three identifiers alone are enough to uh, uh, identify a uh, large part of a very large population here, the American population. A very uh, famous example in the recent literature on privacy is a re-identification of five, 500,000 Netflix users in 2008. So this was a database that was uh, made public but pseudonymized. And it has been shown that just by using film rating records, 
you can actually re-identify the people who have been pseudomized in that uh, database. So that's an old example. It has kind of become a, a canonical example in the literature of privacy. Uh, to show the power of re-identification with simple informational cross-checking. We can see here already a little evolution, which is that um, the information that is used is not your typical bureaucratic information. It's film rating records. So it's a little bit intuitive that it would have that identifying power. So already you can see things evolving here. But then in the last decades, you can see more uh, radical and more powerful use of that power of um, database cross-checking. Um, in 2013, there was the case of re-identifying the routes taken by some celebrity from the pseudonymized, pseudonymized database of New York City, New York City taxis. Um, and in 2015, in a paper by um, uh, De Montjoie, uh, it was shown that for geolocalization point, that, uh, oh, that doesn't make sure of French and English and my spelling here, um, my autocorrect must have gone wild a little bit. So it was shown that for geolocalization point, the amount spent and the shop types were enough to re-identify almost all person in a 1.1 million credit card users database. Um, so that shows you that a uh, uh, very low number. What is surprising here is not that cross-checking that kind of information could lead to re-identify you, uh, the uh, surprising thing is how little information you actually uh, need for geolocalization points. Um, that's also, uh, that also has become a classical reference in the privacy literature. That's not a lot. Uh, many of your, the apps that are probably on your smartphones right now collect thousands of uh, geolocalization points on you every day. Uh, so that's not much, but that's more than enough to identify you. So already that, all those results have already led some legal scholars to talk about the possible death of anonymity in our digital world. But if you look at that, there's no, the interest for me here is that there's only a major privacy issue, um, but there's zero machine learning in there. It's basically more powerful, a little bit more refined use of information cross-checking in large databases, that's it. That's it. Uh, from a methodological point of view, there's no gr great uh, breakthrough here. Uh, and why is that uh, interesting for me uh, uh, is that that's where the uh, long term, uh, much too long term, much too long run um, perspective comes into play. Uh, I'm going to be very abrupt here for. Um, reasons of time limitations. Uh, for those of you who might know that literature, I, I will be very, very sketchy and synthetic, but the, the basic message is this. Um, if you take a long-term perspective, there's a very, very um, strong link between cognitive techniques, such as writing and computing and computers today and bureaucracy. Um, so, there is massive archaeological evidence that the first uses of writing and counting were purely bureaucratic. It would take um, probably several hundred years before writing and counting were used for anything but purposes that are deeply bureaucratic, such as transaction receipts, fiscal rolls, contracts, accounting, and so on and so forth. That was really the primary purpose of those techniques from the get-go, from the end of the fourth millennium BC in Mesopotamia and Egypt and on, it was really a bureaucratic use. So this led me to formulate what I call the long run hypothesis, which is that any major evolution in cognitive techniques is bound to have a deep effect on the exercise of power through bureaucratic means, because this is not only something that you'd see at the very beginning, of the history of cognitive technique. But if you look at long-term trends, I don't have time to argue for this. But if you look at long-term trends, um, much after that, bureaucratic use of writing and computing are going to remain major, major cases and a large part of the use of those cognitive techniques. So writing is, in, if you look at the long, in a long run perspective on the history of humanity, 
The first use of writing is definitely not to, to write down poetry or science. Um, it's to write shopping lists and uh, a counter um, and ledgers and counting books. That's really uh, one of its major uses. Um, sorry, it's not very romantic, but that's, uh, that's the case. Um, and if you try to um, specialize that long run hypothesis, for uh, what is at stake here, uh, which is for privacy concerns. Um, what you can see as, and again, I'm doing very abrupt and sketchy and a very complicated history, but what is extremely important in the origins of cognitive techniques also is the bureaucratic formalization of economic transactions. So to cut the very long story very short, one of the first examples of use of writing and counting uh, in Mesopotamia and also in Egypt are sorts of transaction receipts. Things that say who received what when. So basically some guy gave seven oxes to another guy on a, on a given day in exchange of 20 sheep. That's the beginning of writing and counting, okay? Uh, so you can say, see immediately that from the get-go, identification of the actors involved are a key part of uh, bureaucratic activity. And more than that, uh, very soon after in, uh, in the databases of the, uh, well, not the archives, rather, of the first uh, states, you will see that what I call institutional identity, which is a portrait, the image that institutions have of you, the data that they have of you, um, is a key part of institutional bureaucratic power. So you can specialize the long run hypothesis and say, well, any modification in cognitive techniques affecting institutional identities and, in the, and institutional identifications or identification processes, if you, if you like, is bound to have a major political impact. Uh, so that's uh, that's how you use the long-term hypothesis, long-run hypothesis in that particular context. Uh, and then you can get with those two elements of in mind, the long-run hypothesis and the contrast class. You can start to look at a phenomena that really involves machine learning. Um, and the first thing that needs to be said is that privacy is not to be reduced to anonymity. Um, it's not only about giving you a name or giving a name to an action or naming the person responsible for an action. It's also more deeply about accumulating knowledge on you and, and integrating that knowledge into the institutional identity that you have. And what machine learning does is that it gives a fast and counterintuitive, and that's a very important pro property, that counterintuitive aspect. It, gives, it creates a fast and counterintuitive expansion of our ability to deduce some information I from some data D. So let me try and uh, take some example of this um, very quickly. Sorry, I didn't put all the references, but there are just too many of them. and it, it, the slide is crowded enough as it is, so please don't hesitate to ask for references if you're uh, interested in a particular point, but I just didn't want to crowd um, the slide too much. Though so some example that some of you might be familiar with, um, so Facebook has been suspected, um, let's say many times to infer sensitive informations, such as race, um, sexual orientation, confession, political beliefs from your online behavior or for your list, from your list of contacts. They are also highly uh, suspected to infer your psychological state, uh, to try to infer if you are a sad teen, for instance, and to try and infer if they can use that to sell you stuff uh, because that's their main activity. And, and that uh, it has become a whole uh, branch of the research in the field to try and see if you can um, deduct or infer with a high probability um, some psychological information from your online behavior. So there has been um, 
attempts at diagnosing depression from Twitter use. Um, there has been attempt at detecting neurodegenerative disorders from web searches. Um, so using Parkinson's disease related query terms, cursor movements, repetitions, and other and previously known factors. And there are also been claims, both are claims because they cannot be, um, they cannot be checked because they are depend on an algorithm that is proprietary, but there has been claim um, that by some companies uh, working for uh, actuaries that they can predict an insurance uh, applicant's health status uh, with precision comparable to a Mexico exam from thousands of third party data sources. Um, so without even a medical questionnaire that sometimes might be illegal. Uh, so that's something that shows up in the RICO report, RICO report in 2014. So all of the example here are not about information processing. Okay, they're all about machine learning. They all harness the power of machine learning to infer, and, and that's, um, sorry, I gotta see if I can switch more easily from slide to slide than I can right now. Okay, let me try, okay. So what all of the examples are doing, they're all using machine learning, they're all using recent techniques to try and harness the power of correlation between target attributes and countless and seemingly unrelated attributes. So you can see that they are able to infer with a high probability uh, attributes that are sensitive uh, in the widest possible sense from data and or other social attributes that are seemingly unrelated, such as element of your online behavior. Uh, so this raised several issues. Um, the fact that this inferential power is not only greater, but also more counterintuitive or surprising, means that it's harder for a subject to anticipate what they reveal through the data. And it means that all the protections that you have, especially in the law or the technical protection that we can through many forms of statistical get around strategies. And it means globally that it's harder to understand how we are perceived, especially by institutions. Uh, so I'm, I'm um, here referring to work uh, 2019 by Weister and Middlestadt where they talk about the right to self-presentation as part of our privacy rights. So basically the idea that we should have some control over what the institutions can know about us. And what those machine learning create is that those, not only those institutions collect data surreptitiously about us, but they're able to infer sensitive information about us from data sources that seems merely, seem, that are seemingly innocuous or completely unrelated, or maybe not completely innocuous, but completely unrelated to the attributes that you would like to protect. And that is highly problematic, and it has a form of fundamental legal consequence, which is basically the end of a paradigm. I don't like to use the word paradigm in my presentation, usually, um, because it's it leads to, uh, very messy conversations about Thomas Kuhn usually that I don't want to have, but I don't think I have really something um, else to say here. It's really the end of a paradigm um, of data protection based on restriction on the access to data. So basically the idea is you can't protect what I can deduce. Uh, there is no point in protecting your private information in the toughest of analog or digital vaults if someone can infer what is in that vault with more than 90% probability from data that anybody can scrap from the internet. Uh, so it means that a lot of our technical and legal tools, which are based on restricting the access to data becomes irrelevant in front of those and um, that inferential power. And worse, I'll come briefly back to this later on. We're still uh, model inversion attacks. Uh, model inversion attacks uh, are something that uh, 
allowed to uh, data retrieval from a model itself after it has performed learning over uh, some database, uh, even if you destruct the uh, original database. So the, uh, the other means of protecting your data, which is to destroy it, or something you might also frame as the ultimate degenerate form of restriction to access, which is destroy access for everybody through destruction. Uh, even that does not protect you from uh, privacy invasive uh, searches. Um, because part of the knowledge that was in, in those uh, data is now inside the model itself. And when I say part of the knowledge, it's sometimes all of the knowledge. Because some, uh, especially some deep learning models, uh, for instance, some deep learning models that you use in NLP applications are, um, are hypermnesiac. Before they generalize over the data, they actually record a practical copy of the entire data set inside the parameters. So if you know how to retrieve that from the model, you can basically get a copy from the original data set. You have sometimes you can retrieve entire corpuses of millions of pages of text, some of which will contain uh, sensitive information from the model itself. So basically, even if you destroy the data, the data is still out there. Um, so you can see how problematic that might be, especially when people are completely unaware of that. Uh, which leads us to the final part of this presentation uh, after that sketchy um, uh, view of uh, the challenge raised for privacy by um, the new statistical inferential power given to us in machine learning. Let's try to see some fundamental impacts in our legal order. Um, I tried to, to the, the claim that I tried to put forth um, in that final part is that um, basically the fundamental account, some of the fundamental concepts themselves on which our data protection legal order is based uh, are challenged, uh, are threatened of dissolution by those technical innovations. So that's a very fundamental um, effect, um, so is the claim. And that's kind of a philosophical moment for data protection laws and for the very idea of privacy that is created by those technical innovations. So that's that's the broad claim. Now, uh, let's get into it by um, some basic re reminders on the protection of personal data, especially in the European case. Um, it's worth maybe reminding the audience that um, there are two sources of the reflection, um, legal reflection on personal data. The first are concerns, which are very old. Some of them back, dates back to at least the 60s. Very old concerns on the invasive power of digital data. Um, again, this is very old uh, in the sense that people were extremely concerned practically 60 years ago for databases and um, treatment power that would be crushed actually by what is on your smartphone today. So this is a very old concern. I mean, the concerns that people have in the 60 would look almost ludicrous uh, compared to uh, the problems that we have now, and, but they were already thinking about it. That's something that I think was very interesting. And of course, the second source of that is a reflection on th the experience of totalitarian states, especially the national socialist experience and the Bolsheviks experience in Soviet Russia um, that spurred a lot of reflection on the protection of citizens against state interference uh, in those decades right after the war. It's, I think it's not a complete coincidence that one of the first comprehensive legislation of data protection was voted in the land of Hessen in Germany in 1970. Um, and then it has spread all over Europe and in many other countries. It is very important to see that uh, data protection law protects all rights of physical persons, not just the right to privacy. And that's why the definition of personal data is any data relating to a physical person, any data. That is much broader than private data or sensitive data. Uh, which are special 
and partly overlapping, but not completely overlapping, subcategories of personal data. Um, so people don't believe me when I say it, but I'll say it again, and I know that uh, this is actually a legal fact. Uh, when I tell you that Mr. Emmanuel Macron is the president of the French Republic, that's personal data on President Macron. Yes, it is. Uh, and I, I know that some people are extremely surprised when I say that, even people who should know better, um, because they were actually uh, implied that they uh, get in touch with data protection laws on a regular basis. But yes, it is personal data because it's a data on a physical person. And the fact that this data is by nature completely public and has nothing to do with a sensitive category of something private does not make it less of a personal data in the eye of the law. It's a completely inten intentionally, it's an extremely, extremely wide notion. That was completely on purpose. Um, that is not a mistake from the legislator. That was made completely on purpose. So now for my most crowded sl slide, um, let's look at the criteria that I use to identify some data. Um, as personal data and see why the way that the law is built right now uh, opens up the prospect of an unbounded growth of the extension of the notion of personal data. So sorry if I play a little bit of legal bingo in that slide, maybe that's not very interesting to the audience. Um, just this is a slide where I try to show that I've read a lot of legal literature, even if I know nothing about, even if I'm not a legal scholar. But there are actually some of those um, criteria that are very interesting, uh, even though you might not be um, uh, as interested as I am in learning by heart all the complicated acronyms for all legal decisions on that topic. So let me be click very um, quick on this if you're not interested to dive into uh, the legal literature. So basically, if you look at the G general data protection regulation uh, in recital 26, it says that for uh, data to be personal data, you have to have a test of reasonable likelihood of identification, which is dependent on the technological context, which means that um, some data might, it's not an intrinsic quality of data basically to be personal. If some data later on um, with a new form of treatment or by composition with um, combination with another data set might help identify directly on in or indirectly a personal individual, then it's personal data. Which means that uh, the notion is, gre is geared towards the growth of extension of the notion of personal data, because as you've seen, uh, recent technological evolution allows to use more and more data sources to infer knowledge on individuals. So the notion is, is built such that it will grow with uh, technological practice in its, in its extension. And especially when you take into account the fact that it's not only about direct identification of a person by name, or there are any other information combined with a name that allows you to uniquely identify that person. But also, it's also about, as is made very explicit in a very influential um, uh, note by the Article 29 Working Party, which is an advisory uh, um, authority on the on personal data. Uh, there's a very, very famous decision in the legal literature called the WP 136. Um, which is that indirect identification is the unique combination of not unique identifi identifiers allowing the individuals to be singled out in a population, even if you don't know his or her name. So, and to make things even worse, um, this decision, this note, it's not really a decision because it's non binding, but um, this uh, note by the uh, WP29, as it is called. Uh, says that an in information can relate to an individual. Remember that relating to was part of the definition of uh, a personal data. Uh, it can relate to an individual in content, purpose, and result, uh, which is meant to include not only data about an individual, but data used to impact on an individual. 
And finally, I'm going to be very quick, uh, uh, quick on this because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. But data is personal, uh, also according to the CNIL, the French authority. If it is possible to single out an individual from the data, even if the person is not strictly identified by name, so that confirmed the interpretation that was in the first recital. It was openly meant to include data collecting for online advertising as indirect identifiers, such as IP address, terminal identifi identifier, data collected by cookies, and as a form of digital fingerprint. And so this has led a legal scholar named Nadezhda Purtova in a recent paper called The Law of Everything to say that with technological evolution and the law as it is built, everything will become personal data, basically. Uh, especially if you use the purpose and result criteria, whether data could be considered as personal data. She quotes an experiment made in a, in a city in Holland when they collected data in, on the street and everything in the environment uh, in the street through a smart city uh, experiment to see what were the factors of crime in that street that was considered unsafe. And so, which meant that the, and all the information that was collected on the entire environment, including the weather in the street, was meant to be used to influence the behavior of passers or people who would pass by through that street. Which means that according to the purpose and or result criteria, whether data could be considered personal data because it is used to impact um, physical individuals. Um, so basically the intuition here is that if you do machine learning plus massive collection of data through smart cities and interconnected objects, you have a possibility of maximalist interpretation of data. So a personal data, which basically means that data protection law will, will basically cover every data under the sun and data protection regimen will become an enforceable law of everything. My personal claim is that even if you disregard the particular criteria that Pertova has used because some legal scholars think that this is not really where the jurisprudence is going, the so purpose and result criteria are not the most important, but my personal claim is that even if you replace it by either criteria in the literature, still you have a massive trend toward an unbounded growth of the notion of personal data, which makes it very hard to enforce uh, in the long run. And another problem with the identification criterion, which might uh, interest uh, the logician and the audience a little bit, uh, which is that according to some recent legal evolutions, and I'm going to speed things up to hold, to hold myself down to my four to five minutes. Uh, if you look at, uh, so some of those criteria, you could actually consider that ML models are also are not algorithm, but data. Uh, so a priori ML models are algorithms. They, they're a very special kind of algorithm uh, they're called cool models because they have predictive power and to distinguish them from the learning algorithm itself. But there are algorithms in, in the sense that are very, really meant to be given inputs and to process them to give you an output uh, according to some semi-formal specification most of the time. So there are, it's very in intuitive to consider them as a weird case of algorithm. But if you consider ML models that are trained on personal data and, and the model inversion attacks that I've mentioned before, it means that it's possible to retrieve personal data from models themselves, which infers that legally speaking, machine learning models, according to some of the criteria in the literature, could be considered as personal data and not as algorithm, which, has, which means uh, a challenge for both legal scholars, and maybe theoretical computer scientists. Um, that's because that indecision in the status of ML models is legally significant in the sense that, as is really well underlined by Washington Middlestad in the same paper on the comments in the European Court uh, of Justice jurisprudence, uh, raw data and processed data are not subjected to the same legal regimen. Uh, so typically, 
the data within the ML models should be considered at least at processed data, and sometimes even as an algorithm, and uh, should be subjected to a completely entire regimen than the regimen of personal data. So that's a problem for the legal scholar. But it might also be logically significant in the sense that it's a problem for a logician who love to think about what is an algorithm or what is a program. Um, usually algorithms are conceived independently of information and data, except maybe for basic type or basic structures like auto set or what have you. Um, but that seems of that form of detachment from uh, the nature of data, the underlying nature of data, it doesn't seem to be generalizable to machine learning models because they learn from a very specific, they are built from a very specific database. And so that's kind of a conceptual challenge also from, for a um, logicians. And I really have to speed things up. So of course, a lot of hesitation in the legal community on, on what to do, I'm going to skip that. In conclusion, very quickly. So just uh, wrapping up. So I was, as you've seen, so uh, ML machine learning and specifically machine learning is behind new techniques of identification and, I, and institutional identities as I defined it. So, which means that they have to be, to be a significant step uh, in the long relations and long and essential relations between administration and cognitive techniques. Uh, which means that there, we, we're bound to have in privacy a technically induced philosophical reflection. Data protection law was largely born against large scale data collection or what used to be seen at, as large scale back in the days and information cross checking. Because it was, when you look at especially the CNIL in France, the Zoloi Information Liberté, and even the famous 1983 census decision by the Bundesverfassungsgericht. Uh, what, what they feared back then was uh, the merging of different uh, databases and the information cross-checking. That was a technique that they had in mind back then in the 70s when they feared the power of data. But now machine learning, and we've seen that this technique has only grown in power, but machine learning adds another layer of, of problems for privacy in the digital world because of that harnessing of of correlation between seemingly unrelated attributes and sometimes sensitive target attributes, blurring out our understanding of what needs to be protected. So that's the end, as I said, that's the end of a technological and legal paradigm based on restriction of access. And for my last slides, so it shows that machine learning as a form of conceptual effect uh, to challenge some of the most basic categories created to protect privacy in the digital age, including personal data, identifiability, and even the, the mere notion of algorithm. I'm slightly over time, but I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mel. Um, are there uh, questions or comments? So you can either speak directly or raise your hand virtually. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so great talk, super interesting, uh, funny, clear. Um, I was wondering about uh, private and sensitive data. So you talked about personal data, um, but you sort of skipped over private and sensitive. And I was wondering um, to what extent these conceptual challenges are still true when you take those into account instead of personal data. Because I, I agree, as soon as you talk about personal data, the whole thing explodes. Uh, does it also explode when you talk about private data too? Um, so if you look at European law, sensitive data is a personal, is a subtype of personal data uh, with extra legal restrictions and protection on it. So it's part of the problem because it's within personal data and it's a, actually a more protective class. So there's a list of 16 informations that are considered as sensitive in the GDPR that you will find your usual list of uh, race, uh, gender, uh, national origin, confession, uh, party membership, uh, church membership, um, union membership, uh, biometrics, medical history, psychiatric history, blah, 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 genetic data, blah, 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 blah. So that's, that's basically the list 
of data on you that can be used typically to be discriminatory against you. So that's the same notion as protected class in American law, basically. Uh, but that would be the current notion. Private is private is a very uh, weird thing. Uh, private is not something that is defined rigorously within personal data law in the European context. Private privacy is supposed to be part of the rights that you protect through uh, personal data, but you also protect other rights. So the relation between privacy and personal data is actually very complex. Um, and there has been some legal scholar um, challenging the fact that we don't actually have a clear understanding on what the relation between privacy and personal data is or should be. We have two fundamental rights in the chart, European Charter of Fundamental Rights. We have Article 8 and Article 9 on privacy and personal data. But what is exactly the relation between them? Uh, should even personal data be considered a fundamental right, or is it just a way to enforce privacy in the digital realm? Uh, or it's it's not clear. You you would be amazed by the hesitations that you can find in extremely recent legal literature on is personal data rights a fundamental right, or what is it, or what, why it is there in the Charter of European Rights? I mean, it seems like nobody has a very clear idea on that. And that's probably because of that plastic nature of the notion of privacy. It spreads, it both, you know, denotes something very intimate and very specific. But when you start looking at it, it, it spreads in all kinds of direction, reputation, autonomy, self-determination, freedom of expression, control of my representation in, in institutions and others and blah, 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 and spreads all over the place. <laughs> so it's extremely hard to capture. That's one of the difficulties of that chapter. I hope I've answered your questions on that. You did. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Further questions, comments? Yeah. Um, maybe Hi. I have a question. Yes, why not? Um, so, um, I mean, I know it from, from other areas. I mean, what do you expect? legal efforts, I mean, can actually achieve um, under the premise, let's say that at least in, in, in the worldwide um, connection of the internet, I mean, there will be places where you don't feel obliged to a law which might be issued in the United States or somewhere in Europe, and you just go on. I mean, this is not a reason not to think about the legal issues. <laughs> <laughs> by no means, but is it realistic to expect that you can enforce any kind of legal mechanism um, in what's I there in the internet reality? Um, okay, yeah, well, that's a classical question um, in legal reflection on the law in the digital realm, which is much bigger than the uh, larger than the, the issues I've just. Uh, mention here. So I, I'm just going to do a, a couple of quick comments on that. I think um, on the one hand, you can see why some people will uh, actually enforce the law, even if you're the not part of your territory. There is a very basic reason for that, which is trade. Uh, people want to be authorized to trade with you, especially if you're big, economically speaking. So that's the main reason why a lot of, of countries throughout the world have now started e imitating the GDPR in their regulations to be able to trade with Europe, basically. So when you are economically big, uh, people will have an incentive to uh, respect to some extent your law. I mean, not necessarily more or less than the people who live in your country, but uh, in your territory, but there's still a very strong incentive to enforce the regulations to have market access. So that's something that Europe has. It has the largest market in the world uh, in terms of uh, consuming power. So it has some indirect power, indirect incentive to have its law enforced. Then yes, if you look at other specific, more specific issues, there is a feeling that is shared by many legal scholars that there's 
sort of vanity to try and enforce laws and data and, and algorithm. For instance, if you look at data that is supposed to be extremely sensitive, like biometrics data, which is collective in case of live facial recognition technology, when some journalists have been looking up where that data ends, and it ends up basically in every country, it ends up having commercial use that, is, that was not supposed to have in the beginning, and so on and so forth. This is nothing um, really that, um, that prevents, um, let's say, a Chinese um, intelligent agency to have access to image of your face. Because the image of your face is probably in a database in the internet and is being moved around the globe and is being sold and is being analyzed by someone as we speak. Uh, so there's a feeling of vanity here of the law in front of that circulation of data. Uh, as a provocation, Reinhardt, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise that, that uh, question as a provocation for you all. Um, that actually makes a strong case for some database like facial images uh, to forbid research, actually. Uh, if you look at uh, live facial recognition technology, it cannot work if you don't have the authorization to massively collect the image of faces in the wild, in the public space, without the people knowing it. That means without consent. So basically the technology is predicated on the massive collection of biometric sensitive data without your consent, which we can argue according to European law should be illegal. So basically there is a point that can be made that one of the only way to contain those technology is to ban research on them completely. And to kill, to kill it from the, from the get-go because then there's no database and no algorithm to move around the internet and to escape uh, your attention. Of course, it's a little bit of a provocation. It's never popular to talk to scientists and say, well, let's forbid scientific research. But for some technologies, that seems to be the only way to go. <laughs>